today's webinar topic is on microbial source tracking in the Saginaw Bay watershed. I'm here today um, as the facilitator. My name is Megan Goss and I work for Michigan State University Extension and the Michigan Sea Grant Program and I'll be helping facilitate uh, the webinar. Um, and we also have our um, guest speakers, uh, Joel Kutkowski from the Bay County Health Department and Dr. Tammy Sivy from Saginaw Valley State University who will be sharing information about the microbial source tracking project in the Saginaw Bay watershed in addition to uh, the beach uh, monitoring program in Saginaw Bay and Bay County. So without further ado, um, Joel Kutkowski uh, from the Bay County Health Department will uh, begin his presentation. We'll begin. So, Bathing Beach Program here in Saginaw Bay. Um, I represent Bay County Health Department. Um, so, speaking for everybody, though, in the Saginaw Bay watershed area, we've been testing the water for over 30 years. Um, testing for fecal coliform bacteria, and in the 90s, it changed over to E. coli as an indicator. Um, designated why is to find potential hazards for swimming in the Saginaw Bay area. So um, we're the unpopular group, the health departments that put the closure signs up, but we are testing the beaches to make sure it's safe to swim. We don't want people in the water when it's not. Um, Beach Act of 2000 was adopted in Michigan in 2004, which is what designates the beach um, as a beach. What is a beach? Um, basically it's the public area where anybody can then enter the water and make use of our Saginaw Bay. Okay, um, so we test for E. coli. How much is too much? Um, in a single event, if we sample in one day and the level is over 300 E. coli and 100 milliliters of water, unfortunately, we get to close the beaches. Um, if it's over 130 in a 30 day average, meaning the ongoing average is high all the time, we would close the beaches and leave them closed until that 30-day average drops below 130. How do we test? A little bit on that briefly. The old testing methods were cumbersome. Um, they took a long time. They weren't such as multiple tube fermentation, not really the most accurate method. However, it's what we had at the time. We moved into membrane filtration, which was a very accurate method, still very time consuming. And then into cold alert and climate tray, which we still use today. Um, but luckily, we now have some rapid te testing methods. Um, those rapid testing methods um, are, are definitely a welcome um, thing we have now. Old results. 18 to 24 hours after the day we tested, kind of too late. If the beach was bad yesterday, we find out today, um, we're not really doing the public any good. So with rapid and tested methods now, we can get results the same day, two to four hours sometimes. So testing the beaches, basically we walk out with waders, fill bottles, um, bring the water back to the lab. We test the beaches that are considered public beaches. If it's a public beach based on the designation in the Beach Act, we're out testing those beaches weekly. We have what's called an area of concern or an AOC in the Saginaw Bay and Saginaw River. That AOC is um, determined by a beneficial use impairment without getting into that too much, one of the beneficial use impairments we have are beach closures. We close our beaches and we close our beaches too often. So we are listed as an area of concern because of that. And you can see in the sign, one of our closed signs, it's one of our unpopular closed signs. So something we don't like to do. So, and then what is an AO, an AOC BUI? Um, it's, I'm not gonna go into it and read this, but um, something we want to get rid of. How are we going to get rid of? And you will hear a little bit later from Tammy. Um, we will be doing source tracking continually to try and find the sources of the bacteria and hopefully find a way to stop contamination that's coming into the Saginaw Bay. Let's talk about Saginaw Bay. Let's talk about some of the unique problems we have here. Um, this is a good part of the webinar for me. I like to talk about 
Why are we having problems? Where is the bacteria coming from? What are the problems we have? Figuring all that out. So here's a picture of one of our drain discharges. Um, you can see on the picture that the water is bubbling up out of a hidden drain. And this, this is a point where we know we have high E. coli numbers. It's coming from some of the drainage ditches, which we are testing in the source tracking. And as that goes out into the bay and mixes, that's impacting our beaches. So some of the other problems, when you look at the, the Saginaw Bay and the watershed, we have influence from the Saginaw River, Colin River. There are drainage ditches within the bay every half a mile to one mile, the entire bay and through the watershed. Um, wind changes the flow. Uh, it can be moving once, one way one day and a different way the next day. Um, makes it hard to determine if we have an, uh, an inflow of contamination from a drain, where is it going? We don't always know runoff from con con concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs, septic system discharges, uh, retention treatment basins. Um, a little bit on those, concentrated animal feeding operations. Those are uh, large feeding operations for say 10,000 chickens or maybe a thousand head of cattle. The runoff from those end up eventually in the watershed and into our bay. Uh, septic systems. Septic systems could discharge directly to a ditch, although uncommon as a direct discharge, you're just going to see it could be something going into, say, fuel tile and eventually working its way to a ditch down the road, or it could go into somebody's sump pump and pump out, and they may not even realize it. Um, it could be a seepage going through the groundwater or one other way that is very difficult to find. Retention treatment basin overflows. We have an aging infrastructure of sewer systems and drains that lead into large storage facilities. And those sometimes, um, after some partial treatment, end up overflowing into our watershed. And that is another potential problem. We have erosion from um, riverbanks, streams, farmland, all the drainage ditches coming in. Um, we also have one of the largest waterfowl habitats in the world in Saginaw Bay, which means we have contamination from birds and many, many different species of waterfowl. Um, that also makes it difficult to determine sources when we're doing the source tracking part. Of it. Saginaw Bay is also very shallow and very warm, so that leads to more and more bacteria. It's a, it's a good environment for bacteria to grow. Um, our influence area in Saginaw Bay is five and a half million acres, covering 22 counties. Some pitchers, some ducks, those are part of the waterfowl issues we have. There's uh, multitudes of waterfowl everywhere you look within this bay. Um, loss of topsoil drainage, you can see a picture of a, of a farm. That all ends up into our bay. Some of the stagnant ditches, this is actually a sample point on the right side where we're sampling one of the drains. And we do find some hot, very high E. coli numbers there. We are finding a lot of bird contamination. Some of the preliminary uh, data seems to show. And as you can see, we have a lot of birds. Um, septic systems. Here's some old um, archive photos right from Bay County from discharging septic systems. The one on the left actually did go down to a bank and um, during heavy rain would enter the, the Kalkalan River. Um, that has since been fixed, of course, that was corrected. And then on the right, you'll see another septic discharge, which when it rains, that little puddle of sewage may end up in a ditch in, in the bay. Multiple outflows from um, unknown sources can enter ditches rivers, streams, wherever, that all ends up in the bay also and impacts our, our beaches. The concentrated animal feeding operations in these pictures, the chickens, cows, uh, those exist within our watershed. Here's an interesting picture in aerial photography of the Kalkalan River. It shows um, when the discharge comes out of the river, depending on the direction of wind, one beach may be safe 
on one side of the mouth of the river and on the other side it may not. And as you can see, the coloration from the water moving one direction and not the other. Um, and that could turn around in a matter of an hour with a wind change, meaning this, the beach could be safe now and not an hour later. So those are some difficulties. And then um, satellite imagery of the bay on the right show the discharge from the Saginaw River, how it's moving more to the east. You could check that a week later. It might be on the west side of the bay. So uh, our contamination sources coming in from all the influxes move daily. It's hard to determine where and um, determine ahead of time where those may be. So in our the E. coli results high, we're finding that in high winds, it's churning up bottom sediments, it's washing contamination off of the bay, beaches, um, it seems to impact the numbers. We have heavy rains that tends to lead to high levels. It all leads to um, a guess. Predictive modeling is difficult. So what are we doing now? Well, QPCR is one thing. Rapid testing. We know today how bad the beaches are instead of tomorrow. We're doing source tracking to look for those sources. Where is it coming from? Is it from humans? Is it from birds, cows, ruminant? If we find those sources, we hope to eliminate those sources when possible and maybe someday eliminate the beneficial use impairments and hopefully down the road removing the area of concern that we have now on Saginaw Bay. We're going to continue on with our presentation and shifting gears. And Dr. Uh, Tammy Sivy from Saginaw Valley State University will be sharing more information on the microbial source tracking process. Hi, everybody. Um, I, as Megan said, I'm from SVSU, and my students and I for several years have been privileged to work with the area of Bay, uh, the area Saginaw Bay Health Departments in using some new methods in order to uh, study and determine sources of fecal contamination in order to aid in protecting human health. All right, so Joel has already touched on this a little bit, but I just wanna go a little more in depth and talk to you about what it is that we're actually measuring. Uh, coliforms are a general uh, category of bacteria that we use in order to figure out what the health of the watershed is. Uh, so high levels would indicate that there's a lot of bacteria and low levels would suggest that the health is pretty good, although we're always gonna see certain, certain numbers of bacteria. Uh, we're mostly interested in whether there are fecal coliforms because that would indicate that there's been some contamination from feces. Um, Rather than having to study all of the pathogenic microbes that may exist in fecal contamination, we actually have chosen typically to study one certain one, and that is E. coli. E. coli is at a high incidence in feces, and we can use it as a good indicator, um, depending on its levels, as to whether we think there is fecal contamination in a waterway or not. So if you're familiar at all with a method of testing for E. coli, it's probably the coal alert method. The coal alert uh, method is a culture method. It's uh, put out by the company IDEX, um, and it requires overnight incubation, as Joel mentioned, in order to determine the levels of E. coli. Very briefly, uh, E. coli specifically produces an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase, and E. coli is the only bacteria that produces this enzyme. So when we incubate a water sample with a bacteria culture medium, as well as a synthetic substrate for this enzyme, um, if there is E. coli producing the enzyme, the enzyme will work on that substrate, on that molecule, and produce a fluorescent product. So what you can see in this glowing tray on the right is um, a number of wells that have fluorescence, and that tells us that E. coli grew in those wells. And by counting the number of fluorescent wells after that overnight incubation, we can then back, back calculate in order to determine the levels of E. coli. Now, as we've already learned, the allowable level in the state of Michigan for full body human contact on a daily basis is less than 300 CFU per 100 mils. CFU stands for colony forming units. It's basically the number of cells that were in the sample originally. There's been a lot of work done on this method. Uh, correlation studies with um, 
epidemiological analysis that shows the number of E. coli, that is this 300 CFU, which would indicate that there are potential pathogenic microbes in uh, the water. And uh, that correlation has been done with uh, different incidences of gastrointestinal illness. So this is a well thought out, wonderful method. It just has that one main issue, and that's that this long incubation could lead to humans having contact with contaminated water before we realize it. All right, so in order to circumvent that long incubation time, the EPA has been working for several years on uh, making these rapid DNA testing methods. Um, so we have joined with the EPA under the guidance of EGLE and MSU, um, several of the health departments as well as academic institutions in the state of Michigan and a few others throughout the country uh, are working on these rapid DNA tests. This very briefly is showing how this rapid DNA testing works. Um, we've chosen a specific gene in E. coli. Again, we're using E. coli as our indicator bacteria. We can bracket this gene with these primers, which are just DNA sequences that um, will bind to the sequence of interest. We also have a probe, which has a reporter on it. And when we incubate this uh, all of these things together, it's kind of a little bit like cooking, but uh, when we incubate them all together, an enzyme will actually amplify that specific bracketed piece of DNA and it will kick off, knock off that fluorescent reporter. So how does this fit into our overall testing? Well, as we do with cold alert, we collect the water sample. We actually go a little deeper than this picture shows, uh, but we put on the waders and go out to waste deep water. The water is brought back to the lab. We filter the water sample. What you can see here is a filter with the, with the brown uh, circle on it. That's all the sediment, um, as well as other things like cells that we collect from the water. Uh, from those cells, we really just beat the filter uh, that breaks open or lyses the cells in order to give us a, a DNA sample that can function as a template for that quantitative polymerase chain reaction method that I showed you on the previous slide. What's on the bottom here, these two graphs, is just the kind of data that we get. Uh, we won't go into how the analysis is done right now, but realize that the amount of fluorescence or reporter that we see uh, is, uh, is able to determine how much of the E. coli DNA was in the sample to begin with. So we go through quite a bit of calculation in order to come up with a number of E. coli cells that are in the sample. So this uh, method, the quantitative polymerase chain reaction method that measures E. coli DNA, it's called Method C by the EPA. Uh, it's gone through a long validation study, literally hundreds of liters of water have been analyzed by uh, 21 different laboratories in order to determine whether this method uh, will actually give us uh, results that would allow us to accurately close beaches. Um, and I'm so thrilled to announce that in just this past June, uh, two papers were published in Water Research. You can see all the various authors there, which just shows the huge amount of time and commitment that was put into getting this, this method validated. Um, these papers share some of the, uh, uh, the data criteria for this method. And drum roll please, da, 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 da. this is the number that we're looking for with this rapid DNA testing. 1.863 log 10 DNA copies per reaction. I'm sure this number doesn't mean much to you. Um, it doesn't mean much to anyone uh, except those of us who have been doing this validation study for a long time. But let me tell you that it is comparable to that 300 CFU per 100 mils, uh, which is the level at which we close beaches based on that overnight incubation method. The amazing thing about this rapid DNA testing is that we found that it's extremely accurate and most importantly, we get results two to four hours after sampling the water. So we have been using it this summer for the first time in Bay County, um, 
and Iosco County and Huron County in order to determine whether a beach should be open or closed, hopefully open. Uh, and we actually enter those results into BeachGuard, the Michigan BeachGuard site, in the afternoon of sampling rather than the next morning. We're also continuing to do coal alert though in order to make sure that uh, our results are reliable. So those coal alert results are then entered into BeachGuard the following morning when we obtain them. Okay, so what we have here is a uh, map of part of the lower peninsula of our beautiful state of Michigan and the, the red squares are uh, spots where samples are taken for qPCR analysis. I just want to point out how many red squares there are around the Saginaw Bay. It just shows the dedication of the health departments in our region to trying to protect human health by, um, by using this rapid DNA testing method um, in order to make it so that we get results out to the public much more quickly than what they have been with previous methods. Okay, so this webinar is supposed to primarily be about source tracking, but in order to get to this discussion about source tracking, I needed to tell you about some of the rapid DNA testing methods that we're using now because they, those methods and um, that molecular, the molecular biology techniques have brought us to this point where we can do source tracking. That is not just determining a level of fecal indicator bacteria, but hopefully determining the actual source of that fecal indicator bacteria. Last summer, the summer of 2018, we were brought into discussions uh, with um, the Office of Great Lakes uh, to determine whether we wanted to participate, and by we I mean uh, Saginaw Valley State University, um, as well as the health departments in the region, whether we wanted to participate in a large scale source tracking project. After a lot of going back and forth and figuring out what needed to happen for this project, the project was funded and launched in August of 2018. You can see by all these participants here, the dedication um, and the amount of effort that is being put into this project in order to hopefully solve where any fecal contamination in the Saginaw Bay watershed is coming from. So the objective has been and will continue to be to identify locations and sources of fecal contamination that negatively impact Saginaw Bay. And we're particularly, of course, interested in sites that are used for human recreational purposes. All right, so what is the source tracking? Well, it's basically the same types of methods that we do for rapid DNA testing, but we use a different uh, bacterial genus in order to determine uh, this fecal contamination source. We use bacteroides. The reason for this is because unlike E. coli, which we're used to testing, bacteroides actually has a large variety in um, DNA sequence based on uh, the host in which the bacteria grew. So this is an organism that also exists in the intestinal tracts of a variety of different animals. And we can exploit minor differences in DNA sequences in order to determine what the source of the bacteroides is. And you can see on the right here that we just have a few sources listed there, humans, uh, cows, birds, deer, dogs, but there's many more that potentially could be fecal contamination sources. So with our pilot study, which we began last August, uh, we were able to use quantitative polymerase chain reaction, the qPCR methods, very similar to the rapid testing, but this time uh, specifically geared towards bacteroides, uh, we were able to pick up human, ruminant, and bovine markers. What I'm showing here are just the standard curves that were used in order to make this uh, method quantitative so that we could actually relate or compare the levels um, of the markers that we picked up at each site. All right, so while this took place uh, in a, several different uh, uh, counties surrounding the Saginaw Bay watershed, I'm just showing you the Bay County uh, source tracking sampling sites. In addition to our typical uh, beach uh, beaches that we test regularly up to three times a week, we added on many different drains and bridges 
um, and other inlets into the Saginaw Bay. Uh, the whole project has 31 different sites. This summer we have even a few more that we've added in order to do this source tracking analysis. What I'm showing here is just one graph which shows the results that we got from um, the state park or the Bay City uh, State Recreation Area. Um, on the x-axis you can see dates. These are all from 2018. Uh, the blue bars are showing us uh, the coal alert results which are in colony forming units per 100 mil and rem remember that 300 CFU per 100 mil is the limit for allowing human exposure to the water. That is, we close the beaches at 300 CFU per 100 mils. And so of all of these tested last summer, there was only one date, uh, and that's May 29th when the beach was closed. And it's really awesome that the beach hasn't been closed since. So uh, the Bay City State Recreation Area has been exceptionally clean since that one day last summer. Uh, we actually did test many more days with cool alert and rapid testing than what's shown here. But all of the dates shown here are those which we continued with in order to do source tracking analysis. What you can see in our source tracking results and the numbers based on that log number, the log 10 DNA copies per reaction, um, on the second y-axis you can see what um, the units are we have two dates which showed evidence of human source, uh, human bacteroides marker. Um, now, the unfortunate thing is that because the funding and the project didn't officially start until August, while we had these samples stored for our normal beaches, we don't have them previous to August of 2018 for the various inlets that we added for um, the remainder of the study. So, what we're doing then is um, expanding uh, the testing season. This summer, we actually have samples stored for all of 2019 at our beaches, as well as all of the inlets that we're using for source tracking analysis. So we should be able to get a much better picture of um, where uh, fecal contamination is actually originating. We should be able to get to that point source um, and start to hone in on it better using some of our results from this summer as well as from continuing seasons also. I'm super excited to say that the Office of Great Lakes Money also, the funds also uh, allowed us to purchase a digital drop polymerase chain reaction system. Uh, this is just a picture of the system that is at MSU. They had it first and we now have it and we're the only two, as far as I know, using it for uh, source tracking in the state of Michigan, so we're really excited to be using this advanced technology. The idea is that it's basically quantitative polymerase chain reaction on steroids. So if you'll just uh, forgive my biochemistry geekiness for a second, uh, I want to explain why this DDPCR is so much better. Essentially, while with the thing labeled as A here, you see that's the standard qPCR, we only have one reaction. In B, this shows the DDPCR, the digital drop PCR reaction um, method. And what happens is that one reaction is actually divided up into 20,000 droplets. Uh, in those 20,000 droplets then you get partitioning of the DNA template and it makes it more likely that the, the enzyme, the polymerase that's responsible for the amplification of the DNA, it can hopefully find its template much better. Additionally, it should separate out any uh, interfering compounds that prevent the qPCR reaction from occurring. This is something we've been fighting for um, a long time in our methods in the Saginaw Bay watershed. As Joel said, it's a really complicated watershed and there's a lot of things in the water that sometimes make it so that our qPCR reactions don't work great. So what this method will allow is that we're able to uh, get rid of interfering compounds as well as potentially be able to um, sense much lower levels of DNA in order to make the method much more sensitive and get us better results for source tracking.
All right, so what now? I've already mentioned that we've been storing filters for the entire season of 2019 at our 31 sites, uh, which includes the beaches, but also the inlets. So we'll be doing uh, source tracking analysis of those. We're gonna continue to optimize the digital drop PCR methods moving forward. This is what we're gonna use for our source tracking. One of the most exciting things about it is that we can do more sources. Uh, we tested for human, ruminant, and bovine. Um, and something I didn't mention before is that ruminant does include bovine, uh, but it also includes deer and goat and sheep, uh, and maybe llama. Uh, but anyways, uh, the ruminant one is much more sensitive than the bovine one, so that's why we use that market quite a bit but we, we'd basically like to expand out beyond those as Joel said we have a huge waterfowl population and and anecdotal and observational evidence has suggested that probably birds are the source of a lot of the contamination in our watershed and that's something that we need to know we're also going to based on our results consider more sites um, upstream or up drain for source tracking analysis and that will help us to more pinpoint the source, the actual physical source of where contamination is coming. Just to finish up here before we try to answer some of your questions, whatever we can get to, we just want to do some acknowledgement. Um, I would like to thank my students for the past several years at SVSU. They're undergrad students. They do a fantastic job. They go out and sample water in the morning. They do all the filtering. They set up the coal alert. They run all these qPCR methods. They're really quite remarkable. Um, Eagle has been the source of funding for a lot of this that we've done. Uh, I want to thank Megan from Sea Grant and MSU Extension for running this uh, webinar for us. We technologically wouldn't be able to do it without her. Uh, there's three health departments listed here. Bay County, Joel, you saw earlier from Bay County Health Department, um, Huron County Health Department, District Health Department number two, which is uh, centered up there in Tawas. We also have Aranac County, which has provided us with um, some samples. We're going to get some samples from them to do some source tracking also. These health departments, which are surrounding the, the Saginaw Bay, they really have nothing but the public interest at heart, and they just really want to make sure that we can get to the bottom of what's causing fecal contamination and hopefully eliminate that and get this beneficial use and permit removed for the watershed. Um, the US EPA uh, has been leading the way on these rapid DNA and source tracking methods and without them we really wouldn't be where we are today. Two particular people uh, at Eagle are Dr. Shannon Bruce and um, John Riley who have been uh, cheerleaders and sources of funding um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot of different people, Rich Hoagland, etc, cetera, etc, cetera. Uh, but uh, thank you all for listening and we'll be happy to take some questions. Hopefully we can answer them. Sounds great. So now um, I will share some of the questions that we have received throughout the webinar. Um, if you have questions and haven't already submitted them, please send through the question and answer feature. I also um, have received some questions that you would like to follow up directly with some of our presenters. Great. Um, you can see on this screen that their contact information is listed and we'll also include this, um, their contact information when sending out the recording from the webinar. So I'm gonna begin with um, one of our first questions. Um, and the question is, do you know if studies or investigations exist about how much um, users contribute to microbiological contamination of pools and or water bodies, meaning people that are swimming? Hmm. There are, um, when you say pools though, we're, we're looking at contamination of, of bathing beaches. And, um, our, our scientific background here at the health department has been limited to numbers, E. coli. And um, you know, as far as sources, that's why we're, we're working with SVSU right now to figure out where those sources are coming from. And we're hoping to get a, a handle on that and find out you know, what's going on where the sources are, what the percentage of each source is so we can uh, um, hopefully eliminate the problems. Sure, I think, I think maybe what is suggested is that in a smaller volume, when there's people in the water, are the people who are in the water contributing 
to mm -hmm. the contamination at all. So those are cities that may have been dumping a pool mm -hmm. because you have limited volume there, but also, you know, in a larger beach area are those swimmers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't say that there's testing that shows anything from from the swimmers themselves. We hope not. Um, not not out of maybe beaches, no. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> well, thank you for addressing that question. Um, I have another one. Um, are there any labs in Wisconsin that are doing qPCR testing that you are aware of? Definitely, um, Sandra McClellan's lab, uh, which is in Milwaukee, I believe. She is, has been doing this for a lot longer than we have. Um, and there's a few other labs that work with her, um, and they uh, they have been great and helpful for developing the, the source tracking and rapid testing methods. Great, thank you. Um, and then for the, we had another question related to RTBs, which are the re retention treatment basins. Um, so in Saginaw and Bay City, um, aren't the RTBs under a permit to treat and protect uh, public health and regularly meet their disinfection requirements? So just a clarification on the permitting side regarding RTBs. Yes, um, retention tra treatment basin discharges are tested and they have to um, be with, I think the, the number is 200 colony forming units is what they're looking to be under as far as discharges um, to, for, to clarify what a retention treatment basin is um, stormwater and sewage mix within the old infrastructure the old pipes they end up in large structures where there is partial treatment done it's not raw sewage dumping into a river it is partially treated it goes through that treatment process. Um, during very, very heavy rains, the infrastructure is not capable of holding that much water. So it does discharge out into the rivers. Now, uh, there are notifications that come to the health department and to, to other localities of when those discharges happen. That is required so we know when that happens um, and how often. So, and that is something that Eagle is tracking the entire time and they do offer permits and give permits to the municipalities that do have retention treatment basins. So I hope that answers that question. Yes, thank Can you. Can I just interject yes. something? Right after I stopped the last question, I remember that I should also mention, mention Julie Kinzelman, who's in um, Wisconsin. Um, I should have these names ready to go, but I don't. So she also, <laughs> Has been really important in helping with the um, with the qPCR methods. Great, thank you. So, what is the cost of qPCR? Um, I guess if you were doing, if I don't know if, if you could break question. it down for like one test, but so we're regularly trying to figure that out. Um, we run these on a ninety-six volt plate. So, uh, good good question. It's more expensive than Cool Alert. Mm -hmm. But it's much faster than Kohler. Um, it probably costs, oh, I hate to put an amount to it, maybe $20 in reagents per beach sample, something like that. Makes sense. Oh, that sounds good. Um, and I think thinking about the cost is always something to consider. Yes, of course. And then we can think about this in terms of just in comparison to Kohler, that it's right. it's more expensive, but you also do get more information, right. and it's quicker. Yeah, and of course, for all of these things, manpower is the the, the largest expenditure. Um, but uh, it takes a lot of expertise to be able to run um, the DNA testing. So, uh, what's been great for us is that we pay students to do it, mm -hmm. um, and I I hope they think they're getting paid pretty well for a summer job but they do a pretty fantastic, remarkable job at it. Great. Um, so as far as you know, do you know if they're using DNA tracking or the qPCR method in the Huron River, um, of Southeast Michigan? Not sure if you're aware and if it's okay if you do not know. Um, I do not know. Okay, sounds good. So we'll look more into that later. Um, 
I'm sure you can always contact Shannon Briggs, Dr. Shannon Briggs at Eagle, who knows everything about what's happening in the state of Michigan. I don't know how she remembers it all, but she does. <laughs> Um, and then we had a question about clarification sure. um, for beach closures um, and the level at um, for the coliform for three the 300 mm -hmm. um, CFUs. Um, and with that, when we reach that level, is swimming not allowed or is the beach posting a warning that our bacteria levels are high? So how do you, I guess, spread the word if you are over that um, number. Okay, so as soon as we receive results of a, of a beach that has a, a level over 300, we do a beach closure, meaning that public, public beach is closed for use. Um, it doesn't mean we're standing there stopping people from swimming. However, um, a closure is a closure, meaning don't go swimming. It's, it's put out on the news network. We have um, a large number of uh, um, contacts that we send out that information to immediately. So then it's posted on the news, both on locally on MLive, on TV5, TV12. They usually notify people as soon as, po as possible. It's put on Beach Guard immediately. So that closure is on Michigan Beach Guard system. You can go on the Beach Guard system. I generally update that immediately when I know and then send the news um, alerts out. So the news alerts will come a little bit later. Um, and then again, with rapid testing, we're able to sometimes open those beaches the following day, literally two to four hours after the testing. So that's exciting for us because in previous years, as I mentioned before, it was always an extra day. It was a day late. That beach may have been okay the day we actually closed it because the data was from the day before. So um, we're excited to be able to get data and results in, almost immediately. Um, and um, do we stop people from swimming? I'm sure people ask, no, we, we don't have the ability to go out there and stop you. But I would warn people, I've seen people in the past, as I'm posting a beach with a sign, swimming, I do inform them, you know, Please get out of the water. It's not safe. And we don't want anyone becoming ill from anything that may be out there contaminating the water. So it's, it's in our best interest and everybody else to stay out of the water and the beach areas that we do close. Thank you for answering that question. Um, we have another one, and it's a, an if question. So if birds are the main source of fecal contamination, by what method would you recommend preventing that contamination in the watershed? And it's the big, <laughs> that's, big that's question. A big question. Um, so I, I do know that in the state of Florida, they've determined that some of the sources of contamination, on, and I don't know which beaches offhand, were primarily from bird contamination, no, no human contamination. Um, so they actually changed some of the local regulations in some of the areas in Florida where it was all bird contamination and they don't close the beaches per se when levels are high. They warn people that there are high levels of bacteria and it's not a closure. So I'm not saying that's where we would go in Bay County or within the watershed, but if we determine that the sources are only birds, we may change the closures um, after reviewing that. And how do we stop it? I, I don't know. That's a good question because birds are natural to the environment. There may be more studies to find out what do birds contribute beyond um, the E. coli. There's a lot of different things that would have to be studied to find out if that source of contamination is actually a problem or not. And there would be more studies to determine what we're going to do with that. Great. Thank you, Joel. So we have another question. Um, when thinking about county health departments. So is there any funding available to help um, get these health, health departments set up with the QPCR technology? In the state of Michigan, um, I believe it's been offered to health departments or they've been partnered with an academic institution in order to do that. I hate to do it again, but 
they should contact Dr. Shannon Briggs at Eagle. Um, but my understanding is in Michigan, this has been pretty well rolled out. Not everyone's using the rapid testing yet, and especially not to close beaches, but um, they've been trained in it uh, and are continued to be trained in it. Great, thank you, Tammy. And then for those that would like um, Dr. Shannon Briggs' contact information, <laughs> we can definitely share that as a follow-up uh, to the webinar. Sorry, Shannon. Um, so, um, another question we have is, um, we are, so this question is um, related to human bacterioids. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the person that's asking this question is currently getting human bacterioids results from MSU with results reported as gene copies mm -hmm. per 100 milliliters. DNA copies and gene copies are the same thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So their question was, what level of human bacterioids indicates a sewage source is present? I don't know that that's necessarily been determined. Um, realize that source checking is kind of a hit or miss thing where you can take samples at different times of the day and they're gonna vary. You can take samples in the morning and you're gonna see some source and then it may have diluted by the afternoon and, and you won't see it anymore. Um, so if you see it at all, there's a suggestion that there's some sort of influx of human sewage from somewhere. Um, at what level do we actually get concerned with this? That's something that I think is still being considered. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for sharing that information, um, Dr. Sibby. So um, this is a question about the testing methods. Uh -huh. So with these new testing methods, have they resulted in more closures than in previous years? Uh, we have had more closures at a particular beach. I'm sure you are aware at South Bloomwood this year, but it's not because of the testing method. Uh, it is because there have been high levels of fecal indicator bacteria. As I mentioned in the um, webinar, we're not just doing rapid DNA testing. So we're doing that and closing the beaches based on that. And we're still running cool alert as a backup to check the next morning because this is the first summer of doing those results. And the coal alert has backed up with the rapid DNA shown us. So we haven't closed the beaches more because of the new testing, but it has allowed us to close the beaches in a timelier fashion so that we can prevent people from going into that contaminated water earlier. Great, thank you for answering that question. Um, with the qPCR and DDPCR methods, mm -hmm. how do you differentiate between um, and this is a question, might, uh, how do you differentiate between live and dead species? Ah, that's a great question. <laughs> we don't. Um, DNA from live versus dead bacteria, we can't tell the difference. However, that's all worked into that, um, especially for the rapid DNA testing. The live versus dead amount um, remains a pretty constant ratio, and it's been worked into that 1.863 log 10 result, so that that is comparable to the 300 CFU, which is live bacteria. Um, it's comparable to that number. Um, so it may have some dead bacteria in it, but we know uh, that it correlates to live bacteria in the polar alert test. Great, thank you. And we also had um, from uh, Dr. Shannon Briggs, <laughs> as uh, far as she knows, just as an update to a previous question, there is no DNA tracking that is occurring on the Huron River. Great. Thank you for sharing that information. Um, so we have about two more minutes left in the webinar, so we will do our best to answer the questions that we do have right now. Um, so this is a question more on um, the validation. Mm -hmm. So is the QPCR log 10 value uh, for beach protection specific for Saginaw Bay, or no. is that applicable any location? It's for, uh, well, so the state of Michigan has set that 300 CFU per 100 mil limit for beach closures. Um, and so that 1.863 log 10 is comparable to that 300 CFU per 100 mils. So that's what the state of Michigan has accepted as, as the level, the allowable limit for human contact. Other states have different uh, limits based on what their um, 
uh, departments of environmental quality, or now we have EGLE, whatever they've determined. Um, but in the state of Michigan, that 1.863 is, is when we close beaches. Okay, great. And then they had another follow-up mm -hmm. question about implementation. So how did you implement in the QPCR sampling protocol, EGLE's protocol of collecting three samples mm -hmm. for a sampling event and calculating a geometric mean Good. for comparison? So it's recently been found in a lot of studies that for beach sampling, um, composite samples give you similar results or comparable results to doing those three different individual tests. So we've done both where we've taken the triplicate samples and tested them all individually through rapid DNA testing through the um, qPCR method and compared those individual numbers to the coal alert results. But we've also made composite samples, which means taking the, still taking the triplicate samples at a beach, but combining them in equal amounts and then just running one test from those. Um, this saves a lot in both money and manpower. And of course, that's not what the most important thing is. The most important thing is to get accurate results. And for beach testing, it's been published that composite samples give us uh, numbers which are basically the same as the geometric mean of the three individual triplicate samples. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for answering that question. We have reached the end of our allotted webinar time, so our apologies for those that still have questions that are unanswered. You are welcome to directly address your question to um, Tammy or Joel directly via their email. Um, or um, you can also send me an email with your question and I can share it with our subject matter experts. We really hoped you enjoy you enjoyed learning more about the microbial source tracking project in the Saginaw Bay watershed and how um, by identifying sources, we hope to uh, eventually be able to uh, prevent these sources from entering into Saginaw Bay and the watershed and address the benefit use impairments connected to the area of concern. So thank you all so much for joining. We hope you enjoyed um, learning more about this topic. And once the webinar is closed captioned, we will upload it to YouTube and send you a link to the recording. Uh, we also encourage you to complete the evaluation that we'll be sending your way shortly. It'll help us improve future webinars in order to ensure that we're best uh, meeting your needs. So thank you all again for joining us today. Uh, and thank you to um, Joel Kutkowski and Dr. Tammy Sivy. Uh, for sharing information about this project. We really appreciate your time and willingness to share this information with the attendees at the webinar. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, thank you.